This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Fix It 101, the home improvement show to help you do it yourself. I'm Jason Klein here with Pam Pibus, ASHE Certified Inspector at Inspect It Like a Girl, who's currently playing with her camera, and licensed contractor Jeff Sammons from Houseworks. Now, when it comes to home remodeling and rebuilding, it happens because, well, you either wanted it to or you had to. Man had to happens a lot in Mississippi. And when you have to, it's because of a disaster or property damage that, uh, you know, it's where homeowner's insurance comes in. Today, we welcome Spencer Radcliffe from uh, Rusty Healy Insurance to help us discuss the ins and outs of homeowners insurance and of course we're still here to help you with your home improvement questions a matter of fact we've got a couple of those on deck if you want to get your question in join the conversation with us this morning uh, by calling 877 mpb ring that's 877-672-7464 or send an email to fix it 101 at mpbonline.org how you guys doing this morning well, I got on my sweater and my Uggs. Your sweater and your Uggs. That <laughs> that cold outside, is it? It's toasty so in my do, house. Do you have well, a like a? Go ahead, Jeff. You need to be inside, Pam. Right. Well, yeah, but I yeah, it's kind of a long story. I didn't build a fire this morning because as soon as we're done, I'm out of here. Inspecting. So little, yes. Yeah, I'm gonna head out and and do it some is more busy. So, it is. It's crazy. It's crazy. And I have a really story is. from my weekend that Jeff's probably going to really laugh about. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Go straight to it. Well, you know, Santa Claus brought me a new dishwasher, and uh, but Santa oh, didn't install. Santa just dropped it in the kitchen and left. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so never underestimate the value of a good friend that will help you install a dishwasher. Right. So a couple of friends came over to help me. And Jeff, these you may be familiar with this. Did you know that new dishwashers have a float switch? Did not. All right, tell so, folks what that is real quick. Okay, so it is a underneath your dishwasher under the supply line is a pan. You know and in that pan is a float switch. So really? if the pan fills up with water, your dishwasher won't work. Oh, I like it. Okay. Okay. You see, you see where my story's going. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Come so, on, give it up. I know my friends came over, and our first mistake is we didn't watch the video. Yeah, I, you know. But after I watched the video, I was like, "Oh, that's what they meant." So I was uh, underneath the dishwasher, hooking up my supply line, pushed it back in, checked everything, turned it on. And it ran for about 10 minutes, and then it quit. Well, uh, I had somewhere to go, so I couldn't really. I was like, okay, just forget it. And I left, and I got up the next morning, and I thought, ooh, I bet that float switch. And sure enough, I looked under that dishwasher, and that pan was full of water. Oh. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about that story is that it didn't flood my house. It, it didn't ruin the floor. Wow. It just filled up, and that float switch switch turned it off now see folks that's technology in good use right there keeping your house from being flooded it it was awesome i was not aware of that yeah i don't know if all the models have it but i tell you what if i was in the market for a dishwasher i sure would ask that that be on it (laughs) let me ask was your was your dishwasher fancy was it a like high dollar brand yeah it's pretty fancy all right you got to tell me what the brand is it's a KitchenAid. Oh, okay, okay. So it's it's you're right. It's a fancy one. Uh, it's you, a fancy one. We've had and we, it matches Jeff. It matches my Merritt and O'Keefe uh, stove. Uh, That's the reason I got it. It's white, pearly white, and my Merritt and O'Keefe 1955 stove is pearly white. Okay. Well, there you go. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that stove. Yeah, it's cool. But anyway, that's the reason, one of the reasons I did it. Plus, I did an open kitchen plan. You know, Jeff helped me with that. And you can't run your dishwasher while you're watching the football game because it's oh. so loud. 
but these newer models are quiet. You yeah, don't they, even know they're running. Well, they're much better. It's funny because if you get a new dishwasher, if you go to uh, the store and get a dishwasher right now, you can look at the dishwasher before it's been installed and look at the insulation around that dishwasher. Some insulation is internal and some is external. If you look at the high-end models, they're pretty heavily insulated for sound. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, very, very much so. And so, you know, yeah. And also, and, and Jeff, I know, has had issues with this as well. I ordered that dishwasher August 31st. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. Took that long, huh? Yeah, it's there's a backlog on appliances right now. I don't know how contractors are dealing with it. I think I think uh, contractors just pay more to get them faster. Well, no, no. no? Uh-uh. I wish it, I wish it was that simple. But Pam, you are you are one hundred percent correct. We we are having not only a supply chain uh, hiccup with appliances. We cannot get nine foot studs, um, and nine foot studs in the building industry is huge. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's bigger than 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 huge, and we cannot get them. Wow. So. Well, okay, that's uh, one of the things that's been happening. Jeff, uh, tell us what did you get into this weekend? Well. Um, nothing real serious. Um, you know, trying to, um, trying to beat the weather, to, uh, you know, and it's always, if you, if you ever want it to rain, just mention you're going to pour some concrete. Right. So we are, that's what we're back right now. You know, obviously everyone's under a timeline. We've got holidays coming. Right. And trying to pour driveways. And then, of course, it you know rains every other day. Right. So, all right. I uh, I ended up this weekend. I had all kinds of ambitious ideas of what what home improvement projects I was going to get on, and then my my daughter asked me, "Daddy, how do you wax the car correctly?" Uh-huh. So, so that was my thing this weekend. Was you know, of course, and it's and it's partly uh, you know she might want to know. I don't know. Or she might have wanted to watch me do it. So uh, either way, I did it because I'm a sucker for something like that. And uh, But I swear, I, I had the uh, kind of that swirl elbow, you know, for like a day after I finished polishing the car. You know, I, I didn't have like any special tools or anything. So I had to actually use, you know, regular cloths and stuff. But I forgot because I haven't really waxed the car since I was 17. But I forgot that that is labor. Um, that's, that's heavy oh, yeah. labor. Yeah. <laughs> Wax on? Wax on. Well, and you know what? And it, and it, you know, at 17 years old, I could get up under there, under the car <laughs> and get to the tight spots. But, but now it's a little more difficult with the uh, creaky knees and whatnot. But, uh, but I did get it done. It took a, uh, probably an hour more than it would have taken me when I was 17, but it, it's gorgeous and she loves it. And I did all the work, but I'm sure she you learned. Need, uh... Ask Santa Claus for one of those pieces you put on your drill. Yeah, that'd be cool. I did see you can get like a uh, a rotating buffer. You can get mm-hmm. one of those for about thirty five bucks at one of the stores. I was yeah. just cheap that day. So yeah. All yeah. right. <laughs> you know what? Before uh, before we get into our, our our regular topic, I do have an email here that was just really cool. Uh, we've talked about this before, but it is a total cheat, a life hack that everybody needs to know. Okay, this uh, they sent us a picture with of a door. Okay, the door was open, and it was a very uh, tight shot focused in on the latch on the door. And what had happened are the two little screws that hold that uh, that piece of metal in and, and the and the locking mechanism had come out of the holes. They had stripped out. And and the guy's question was, here we go, the screw is loose because the wood around it is no longer solid. What can I put in there to make a solid base for the screw? Now, this happens a lot of times. If you take a screw and go through a, uh, a metal uh, a sheet of any type into wood, you can over-tighten that screw, 
And then, then the wood behind it is then stripped out. So the screw is no longer good. There are a couple of different ways to fix this. Uh, the first one that you'll always hear is get a longer screw. Uh, but there are some other things that you can do that sound ridiculous, but they're 100% true. The very first hack I said on this show, and I think when we came on 2014, 2015, was the toothpick hack. And what that is is that you take that hole that the screw went into, you take a couple of toothpicks, you put the toothpicks inside the hole that is too loose for the screw, put a little glue in there, shove some toothpicks in there, uh, as, as many as you can get in there, and then break them off. So what you've done is you've included new wood and a little glue into the scene. Now put that screw in there, and it'll have something to grab, something to bite as it goes in, Right. And that screw will hold, but you've put wood back into the into the thing. That's a quick fix. One another person uh, will say that you can use a golf tee for the same thing. You put the golf tee into the hole, break it off, put the screw back in. So so there's a couple of ideas. If you've got a screw that's come out and it's it's now uh, the hole is too wide for the screw to actually grab, that's something you can try. A little wood glue. And uh, or Elmer's, it's kind of the same uh, wood glue or Elmer's and then put some toothpicks in there and you'll fill that wood back up. What do you guys think of okay. that? I got a question. So do I have to wait till the glue dries? Nope. Nope. Go ahead. Nope. Screw it in. That, that's a that's a old um, trim carpenters uh, trick and it and it uh, I don't even like to call it a trick uh, and, and it works. Yeah, it, that's it, awesome. Yeah, yeah that's Jason, funny. you are you are you are right on. That's a that's a I've actually used that one for door hinge before. Sure. I had, I had a screw yep, that just too. it had uh, it had kind of routed out that screw. And like I said, whenever you've got uh, a screw going into a metal plate that then attaches to wood, such as a a, a hinge, you know, the the issue is is that the screw can only go so far. Because uh, the metal is blocking it. So all it can do now is turn and churn up that wood. So it's no longer good. So this is the way to fix that sort of thing quickly and easily. I think I'm going to go strip a screw and try it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is fun. I- I'll give you, a, you, know, you You do feel like a, a total hacker when you do it. I'll, I'll be Instant honest. Instant gratification. <laughs> it is. It is. It's like, oh, that works. So. All right, uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back, and uh, today we're going to be talking to Spencer Radcliffe, and it's going to be a lot of fun. It's time for us to go, and we want to hear from you today. Let us know what project you're working on at your home. When we come back, Spencer Radcliffe from Rusty Healy Agency uh, on the ins and outs of homeowners insurance. This is going to be really interesting for Mississippians, so stay tuned. Join the conversation. You can give us a call at 877 877- MPB ring. That's 877-672-7464 or send an email to fixit101 at mpbonline.org. We'll be right back. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. You're listening to Fix It 101 on MPB Think Radio. I'm Jason Klein, who with Pam Pibus, ASHE Certified Inspector at Inspect It Like a Girl, and Licensed Contractor Jeff Sammons from Houseworks. You can join the conversation this morning by calling 877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464, or you can send an email to fixit101 at mpbonline.org. Okay, uh, we've, we've got a guest on the show today, and I'm loving this. Uh, let's welcome to the show Spencer Radcliffe, insurance agent with the Rusty Healy Agency located in Madison. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, this is going to be interesting. We were we were uh, talking about this pre-show, and, you know, it's it's crazy. What makes Mississippi so beautiful and lush is also what makes it, totally dangerous <laughs> as far as natural disasters go i was speaking with someone this morning we think a lot of hurricanes we think of tornadoes but you know what really takes out more houses than anything else in mississippi is flood that that just absolutely wipes out entire neighborhoods at a time so absolutely um so 
Anyway, uh, Pam put you on our radar and suggested you be on the show. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of homeowners insurance, tell us how you got into the industry. Um, let's see. I got into the insurance industry about uh, in 2014, right when I was coming out of coming out of school. I finished school in December of 2014, and and actually started in the summer of 2014. So I started and finished. Uh, finished while I was working and um and I moved over to uh to Rusty's office after about two years of sales experience uh-huh. and um and I've been here with Rusty Healy Agency for it'll be three years here and um starting next spring so I've been here just about three years now good deal well we're going to be able to use that experience here in just a minute before that we've got a call on the line I want to go ahead and talk to it's a fantastic question Anna's on the line in Hazelhurst and wants to know what is an acceptable flooring in the bathroom that's not tile you with us Anna yes yeah so so you don't want a tile floor in your bathroom correct no, it's got to either be replaced or something, and I, it's a very small bathroom. Right. Well, let me ask, what, what what's the beef with tile? Well, I just wanted something else. Oh, okay. Well, that's all you need to ha- – yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> So uh, the reason why I ask that is because there's a, a couple of reasons people don't like tile. Sometimes it's slick. Some, a lot of people, especially in the winter, complain about it being cold. Um, and I've got a question about that from email coming up a little bit later on the show. But so, so tell us what kind of floor you're, you're feeling, Anna. What, 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 what kind of uh, like look or what, what are you looking for? I really don't have any parameters. Uh, just I just didn't know if there was something like maybe vinyl, uh, vinyl sheet vinyl or something mm-hmm. that would. I would say I would say probably sheet vinyl is your is your is your most cost-effective option. However, there are lots of great options that can add a lot of great looks to your bathroom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let the pros talk about the the various options. Do uh, you guys want to? Uh, Pam, Jeff, you want to go? Well, I know what Jeff's he's going to talk about, that substrate. you got to make sure everything's good on that before you start putting anything down. When they down. say, by the way, that when they say substrate on this show because they're all jargony, engineering people, that that's just the wood flooring up underneath the flooring. So. Or concrete, depending on well, if, it, right. if it's slab. Yeah. 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 The other. So you better make sure that's okay. I personally have, I had my bathroom redone and I put a high end, this sounds crazy, peel and stick tile that looks like marble. Mm -hmm. And I did that like 15 years ago and it still looks brand new. Wow. Okay. Uh, There are some other vinyl options out there right now. And uh, one of the biggest ones that I hear about now, uh, people are raving about it, is this, uh, it's a, it, it, it looks like the old Pergo product, but it's actually a vinyl product, and it's about as strong as you can get, and yes, waterproof because it's vinyl. Jeff, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, I do. In fact, I was going to suggest that. Uh, I, I like it, and uh, uh, you can either do a glue down or you can do a floating. Uh, it's very, uh, if you're going to do a floater, uh, it's very uh, homeowner friendly, so what what is this uh, product called, Jeff? What what this vinyl? Call, I call it luxury vinyl tile. Luxury vinyl tile. That sounds like yes. Jeff sells it for a living. But yeah, yeah. I'm you, <laughs> we, we are we are using this product more and more. It's very dur- durable. It looks good. It's cost effective, and if you want to. Uh, homeowner install it. it it's very uh, f- uh, friendly for homeowner install. Cool. That's exactly what I've got. I just Googled it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good I'm for you. I'm a trendsetter. You I are. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anna, there's a couple of options for you. Um, I'm hoping that that, that uh, 
that kind of helps you out. I mean, you can go all the way to, say, like what we used to call linoleum, and that's probably your cheapest option. But what they mentioned right there is going to be certainly very durable. It's going to be around for a long time. Uh, I would, if, if it were me, I know a lot of people are going to get on to me for saying this, but uh, they're, they're coming out with lots of wood products that they say can uh, deal with the water, but in my opinion, not in a bathroom. Uh, bathroom is different. There's too much water in a bathroom. So oh. a- anyway, uh, what do you think, Anna? I think you did good. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, ma'am. All right. Um, real quick. So, uh, Spencer, most people don't think about homeowners insurance until they experience a loss. And man, we get them here in Mississippi. You never know if it's going to be a hurricane, a tornado, um, uh, and I'm just talking about the natural causes. The The greatest natural cause for a home loss in America is the people living in it. But uh, the, the, the issue in Mississippi, you know, tornadoes, floods, floods, a huge thing. Spencer, talk to us about all the types of coverage that are available to homeowners. Um, that's, that's a big one, just the difference between um, the flood insurance and the homeowner's insurance itself. A lot of people, especially first time home buyers and people that hadn't had claims as well, are going to uh, believe that, that their homeowner's insurance is going to take care of their, their flood damage. And, um, and that's completely different than the water damage that would be covered in a homeowner's policy. So that's just something that you would want to talk to your agent about. So you mean, um, so you mean if I make a big mess in my house with water, somehow a plumbing accident that I did, which has happened. But if that happens, uh, you'll pay for that. But if it just rains a lot, you won't pay for that. That's correct. Under the home insurance policy. Now the, the flood insurance policy would pay for that. Okay. So it's one of those, it's one of those, one of those things that you got to be aware of. Well, I will say now, this. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I, I just wanted, and Spencer, by, by no means am I trying to tell you your business, but Jason said rain if the rain is coming in from above, let's say a tree hits your house, knocked a hole in the roof, it rained, that's covered. If that's rain, correct. That's different than flooding. Though. That's yeah. right. If the rain comes through a window, it's covered. If the rain hits the ground and rises, I like to call it rising water, that is probably not covered on your homeowner's policy. So Probably not. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Well, let me ask you, uh, Spencer, I, I actually have to have, uh, I'm in a, well, I'm now in a flood zone. After they redid things about seven years ago, they put me in a in a 100-year flood zone when I was not in one. Anyway, I pay for it now. Um, but uh, it comes from the, the, the big uh, insurance policy in the sky that the government runs for flooding. Is that right? Uh, now, buy it through a company. But is it the, the same most pool? Part. For the most part, yes. FEMA regulates that. That's something that's regulated by FEMA. Um, now, our our agency, being an independent agency, we have access to private flood insurance carriers. Now, that that can be accessible to some people and not accessible to others. It depends on factors like where the home is, the loan, uh, that type of loan you have on your house, that what they require, things like that. But for the most part... Things are going to be done through FEMA, which is regulated, yes, by the government. Let me ask you this. Does that private flood insurance uh, go by the maps that FEMA puts out? Yes, they do. Okay, so it's pretty much the same info. Oh, rates can be different? It's uh, it's pretty much the same thing, but rates can be completely different, which at the end of the day, that's what people are are looking at is, you know, value to how much they're paying. Right. Okay. All right. We've got a uh, call on the line. Ela's on the line in Memphis and uh, asking about an insurance question about a storage unit. You with us, Ela? Hi. Yes, I'm here. How are you guys? Very good. So what's your question? Okay. So I actually have renter's insurance, and then I have, a, like, um, a storage unit. Well, the storage unit comes with their own uh, insurance policy, and then I have additional, you know, obviously, on the renter's insurance. And I just – I – are. Uh, storage unit got broken into, and when I started thinking about the things that were in there and then talking to my father because, we, you know, he's got stuff in there too, uh, realized that there were some very valuable things in there that, um, you know, that I didn't know about that he had put in there. And 
first of all, I'm just paranoid that, you know, everybody in the world is like, yeah, I had $11 billion in there, and, you know, I want to get, you know, 20 whatever for it. And that's really not the case here. And I just want to know how to go about making sure, because we don't have receipts. These are family heirlooms, unfortunately, and, uh, and valuable uh, in and of themselves, not just sentimental. So I just want to know if there... What, what can I do to make sure that, you know, we're compensated for it? Right. Um, the, the best thing to do, if, I know that this is this is past, but the best thing to do beforehand, if, if you know that those things are in there, is to, you know, keep a record of it or some type of, as far as a picture, something like that sitting there. So just to speed up the claims process, but typically on, on, on valuable items, um, that are, of, you know, up to a certain amount. Each company's got a different amount. They'll they'll have an investigator that that'll probably question you and see if everything lines up. And and as long as that lines up, they're not they don't have any reason to deny the claim. Um, so it it it, it that it's really a, a more of a, a normal claims process. They'll just have that extra step to have somebody come in and question you about it just to be sure. Okay, um, and. I can put a claim in with both insurance companies, correct? Um, personally, what I would do and what I'd advise you to do is first talk to the um, talk to the storage unit, um, uh, co- whoever gave you the coverage for the storage unit property, not your renter okay. insurance, and see where that goes first. Um, now, that might have a limit of, of $5,000. I'm not sure exactly what it has um, on there as far as coverage. But that's what I would do first, and if something happened where it didn't cover the full amount or it didn't cover a specific type of theft or something like that, then I would turn to your renter's insurance. Okay, so one other question. Um, so when it says, like, in the insurance policy, when it says a $2,000 limit, I get that, but then at the same time, there's another, you know, like where you list it, and it says, you know, it has to be notarized if it's more than 3000 does that mean that they'll cover it if it's legit, or does that mean they'll have capped at 2000 anyway, so never mind? Um, it, it depends on the type of property. Um, things like jewelry, um, money, um, that that type of stuff is going to have a set limit. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I had a customer that was in a townhouse, um, had a yard that what wasn't much larger than a normal office size, um, and for some reason he had a claim on a, on a very expensive zero turn lawnmower and they had to come in and, and, and question him there. And he has a set limit on, on certain goods, like uh, even on the homeowner's policy, like, um, money, jewelry, it's all the same. It's just a, 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 a little bit different of a policy, but as far as those limits go, it's the exact same. And they came in and did the investigation and asked a few questions, made sure things checked out he ended up being able to prove that he had bought the lawnmower and, and they had replaced it at that point. So it, wow. it depends on the type of property. Wow. That's fantastic. Uh, let me ask you one question here. Uh, Ella, does that help you out there? Yes and no. Um, it's not. Okay. So the item, the bigger item, I mean, we did have jewelry and, and that's fine, but the bigger item was a book that was actually had gold inlay and then a gold uh, etching cover and I honestly did work well, first of all I didn't even know it was there until my dad told me about it and then the second thing is I guess he figured and this is what he told me that I moved from apartment to apartment and he felt like it was safer there because it's under surveillance it's in a temperature controlled environment you know it's under lock and key and you know theft I mean yeah I mean everything can be stolen at some point in some way but that was kind of felt like it would have been safer there than at my apartment so you know that's kind of what the logic there and this is like a family heirloom that was handed down to us from generation to generation and i'm just like beside myself right now but anyway um so there's going to be hardly any way we can do proof of purchase or we don't have pictures of it you know it's just it's a thing you know right yeah right and 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 i i I, i'm sorry that, that that i had to um, that that had happened to you as far as you know losing things that were that important to you, but um, it, it, I'm sorry that I can't give you an exact answer in each scenario because, like I said, each policy might have yep. a 
have a limit to a certain type of property. Um, now, for the most part, you know, nine times out of ten, it, it's going to fall under your, you know, total property coverage, which is probably, you know, twenty, fifty thousand, something like that, under your renter's policy. But, right. but um, more more than likely, things should play out um, eventually to in your favor on, on something like that, up to the amount of insurance that you purchased. But, um, but, but sadly, I couldn't give you a hundred percent answer on, on anything like that when it involves a claim. One of the and things- let me jump in here and yeah. say something real quick. I think this shows the value of knowing what to do. And I, I love the phone call because it helps all of us who haven't had that situation think in those terms and maybe the things that we need to do. And I want to plug local insurance agents. I'm telling you, I've been with the Rusty Healy Agency for a long, long time. And, man, when there's a problem, I just pick up the phone and call them. But if you buy a cut rate insurance, you may not have that. (laughs) Well, uh, obviously, we're not endorsing anything here. I will say uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that we wanted to mention today that has to do with that particular call is, uh, it's so very important to keep an inventory of what you have in your home. And something like that gold inlaid book would have been very particular to get a value on. Am I am I correct there, Spencer? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and to tell you the truth, it's one of those things that most people just don't even think about. And because they've got the home insurance, they pay for it, they that they feel like they've done their due diligence. And for the most part, they absolutely have. But right. it's just one of those extra fail safes that would be nice to have to make sure you have that, that list of things. But um, right. but like Pam was saying, it, it is important to, to have a, a local agent that's somebody that can go to bat for you if um, – if you don't feel like things are playing out fairly or something like that with the claims right. process. Right. All right, folks, it's time for another break. When we come back, we'll continue talking uh, homeowner insurance with Spencer Radcliffe. You can join uh, with your question and comments. Just tell us what project you're working on at 877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. Or send an email to fixit101 at mpbonline.org. We'll be right back. Allison Walker, the lady auto mechanic, host of AutoCorrect. If you're enjoying this podcast, try my podcast, AutoCorrect. We help steer you in the right direction with your car problems. Find me on any podcast platform or at autocorrect.mpbonline.org. You're listening to Fix It 101 on MPB Think Radio, the home improvement show to help you do it yourself. I'm Jason Klein here with Pam Pibus, ASHE Certified Inspector at Inspect It Like a Girl, licensed contractor Jeff Sammons from Houseworks, and insurance agent Spencer Radcliffe from Rusty Healy Agency. And if you missed any of today's program, you can always listen back by podcast using any podcast app or our MPB public media app. Uh, taking questions today, and before Warren, we're going to go to you in just a second. But uh, got another question regarding flooring uh, in a rest in in the bathroom in the home. I've got an email here. We bought a home that added a shower to the half bath, but there's no heating and no electrical outlets. Not even a heater fan overhead. What options are there for heating without electricity in this bathroom? Also, can a heater be added to the fan? Uh, Jeff, I know that you've worked with this sort of situation before. Uh, ideas? Well, I'm uh, I'm hoping that there's an attic above the above the bathroom in question, and if so, just put a uh, Panasonic, which I like, um, heat and fan uh, in that bathroom. Oh, there is a there there is a product. Okay. Sir. There is a product that does that, a heater and fan for the bathroom? Absolutely, yes. And it is very efficient, very easy to install. Now, there's going to be some electrical there, so I'm not recommending the average homeowner do that. Let's bring in an electrician for that. Right. But the rest of it, uh, the homeowner can do. Wow. To, uh, that, that's a fantastic option. So if you've already got a fan, what you do know is that if nothing else, you've got electricity in the ceiling. That's right. Uh, so, so with that, you can go ahead and put in a. You said it's a, it's a Panasonic heater and 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 fan. Yeah, it's, 
Yeah, it's called Whisper Quiet. I, I, I love them. Every, uh, every house we build, I, I put them in. They are very efficient. Um, so I also and, want to comment on something Spencer said earlier sure. about insurance. Um, insurance is based on checks and balances. Yes. And what I mean by that is you call your insurance agent, <clears throat> say, um, I, just, I just bought a house. I want to insure it. It's valued at $300,000. Insurance is going to verify that that house is worth three hundred thousand and not three hundred fifty or not two fifty, so it's all based on checks and balances. But you have to do your part as a consumer. If you have things of value, get those, get pictures taken, get serial numbers, put them in a safe. When they come up missing, or or fire or flood, you pull those pictures out. You show those to to your insurance company, oh, absolutely. They can put a value on that instantly and, and get you paid in, in a week or two instead of in months. Wow. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you. You know, uh, uh, here we come, Warren. But let me tell you, we have something very special on the show today that, that not a lot of you might know. Now, you know that we have Spencer on today. He is an insurance agent. Uh and we also always have Jeff on, and he is a, uh, a a general contractor who regularly fights with insurance agents. So, so this could be a very resourceful show if you ask the right question. So, all right, and then Pam's the referee, right? Pam's the ref, <laughs> who is the home inspector who can tell them what it's actually worth. Anyway, all right, so uh, I don't, I don't like to use the word fight. Right? But, uh, <laughs> Negotiate. Let's, let's change that word. Let's change that word to negotiate. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's uh, go to Warren on the road, um, and he's got a question about deductible. What's going on, Warren? How are y'all? Very good, sir. All right, I have a question for the uh, agent uh, with the insurance company. Yes, sir. Uh, I bought my house in 99, and I have a $500 deductible, and I always kept that. When... Did the insurance companies move that up to a thousand dollars, and why did they do that? Um, that in particular sounds like a company to company issue because not every company. There are very few nowadays that still offer the five hundred dollar deductible. Um, but if you don't mind me asking, uh, what what insurance carrier are you with? All state. All state. Yeah, see, um, you must have a uh, legacy policy. That's what it said. In, in order to, they must have changed, and all insurance companies do this. They change over time, and that's why people see things like rate changes, which are frustrating. Um, but, but it sounds like eventually at some point they changed the way that they rated homeowners insurance, and basically that creates a new homeowners insurance subsidiary company under all states banner. Um, so it's a different type of homeowner's policy that they believe is better, and that's why they've upgraded it that way. Now, with that comes things like minimums and maximum deductible options. Um, now, with that being said, you should have definitely received some sort of notification showing that your deductible had, had gone from 500 to to 1000 um, but that is something that would be a company to company issue. Right. And Warren, I can say this. I, I, I've always believed, and this is the conspiracy mind of me, is that they move that deductible up so that you're less likely to file a claim. Well, possibly. You know, yeah. I've had two in 20 years, but uh, uh, my insurance agent did ask me if I wanted to move it to 1000 and my price would be cheaper by the year, and I told him no. Right. If, if I were you, honestly, and I had a $500 deductible, when you first said it, by the way, when you first called and said, yeah, I've got a $500 deductible, I thought, where's the line for that? Because it's, <laughs> That's extremely low. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, let me – I want to I just give a comment on that for a second. Uh -huh. um, and this is, just, this is just simple economics. I want to carry the largest deductible that, that I can afford. And, Why is that? And the reason, well, I'm going to tell you, insurance should be used for um, for a major event. Let's Absolutely. let's say a limb hits my house, knocks a few shingles off, 
and possibly knocks a hole in the deck. You know, that's not that big of a deal. I, I carry a $5,000 deductible on my personal home for the simple fact I'm only going to use my insurance for a major claim. That's, that's the only time I'm going to use it. I'm not going to use it for, for a thousand or fifteen hundred dollar incident. Uh, um, so I take my larger deductible, it lowers my annual premium, and I weigh the difference. And that's just a personal thing to think about. Okay. Yeah. And well, if I can jump you in. You have to add to that. Uh, you are a contractor, and you got all you got the numbers of all the guys. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I do, I do um, but uh, by the same token, uh, I'm I'm still a consumer. I, I, just because I'm a contractor doesn't mean I don't have to pay for it. So That's true. again, insurance, homeowners insurance, is designed for a major event. It's not designed for a fifteen hundred dollar claim. Right. That's Never. absolutely right. And if I can jump in, that the main key phrase that he mentioned there is the what deductible that he can handle and something that's not going to break the bank. It's it's each person's individual um, individual amount that they can handle and be comfortable with. Right. But I definitely agree with you should only file claims whether it's auto, home, and that's something we've gotten completely away with on health insurance. You know, first thing they ask is is what's your what's your uh what's your insurance company no matter what it is check up but sure. but anyways a lot of people don't realize it but even those small claims even the ones that file and don't pay out um they can increase your rate because of the the, the proclivity of you filing claims is higher than the next person and with all of us doing the due diligence like as jeff is doing on his home insurance and the way he approaches it um rates overall could go down if it at a alarming rate, if everybody would play it that way, rather than well, filing claims for each little thing. Well, Spencer, you're 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 exactly right. Insurance companies look at the number of claims a lot stronger than they look at the amount of claims. Yes. Okay, that's exactly right. All right, that Warren. It sounds like you got a sweetheart deal at some point. Um, but, uh, you know, how, whatever you feel is the right thing to do there, but it's never a bad thing to shop. Never. So, All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, let's keep going. Preston's on the line in Grenada. And uh, how often is property appraised in Mississippi? That's an interesting question. You with us, Preston? Yes, sir. So wh what do you mean by that? What are you, what are you trying to get to? Well, I, I I just I I just well like I've heard it was every four years, and I don't know if that's true, but interesting. Does anybody know? And and uh, and what I was going to lead to though, after I found that out, is is uh, if you know you're two years before the next one, and and uh, a hurricane or a tornado comes through and blows uh, half your roof off and. Just you know, right. does major damage. Uh, is are they supposed to come out and and um, and uh, reassess it? That's well. the The neat thing is, and I, I'm going to give you a lay, layperson's thing. Insurance agencies, uh, well, what you hope from them is to make you whole after an incident. No, uh, no, wait, wait, wait. I'm no. not talking about the insurance companies. I'm talking about the government the state the oh. county that's what i'm talking about uh jeff is our guy that that haggles with the counties and states and all that stuff all the time jeff what do you think of that well okay what i think he's referring to is when the um state uh, when the cities and, and counties assess your property for right taxes um right and i'm you know that i don't put any value in that at all that 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 does not give me the value of my of my property. All, all that does, it, that's a tax base. That's 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 all that does. So, uh, but I, what I'm, not, I'm, I'm not, saying is, if whatever the value is, the tornado, you have severe damage from something, and right, do they do they come out? Are they supposed to come out and reassess it, or do you have to wait two or three more uh, years? 
no, sir. Your insur- you should buy an insurance policy that has replacement cost value. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a program called Xactimate, and it's an estimating software that 95% of your insurance companies use, and that's the cost factor. So as cost fluctuates, your insurance policy should be cost, uh, uh, should be replacement value, not agreed value. You follow me? Uh, if I, if, yeah, I if I buy my saying, house, but that's not really what my question is. But uh, okay, I, I, if if the, if the if the county doesn't come out and and uh, reassess something after some damage, uh, uh, and there you are, and and uh, so I, my question yeah, again I is: do they have to come out after after an emergency and and reassess it for taxes? Hmm. So no, if you left it, no, yeah. no, I don't No, I'm not. And maybe someone will correct me on this, yeah. but, but no, sir, the County, uh, I don't think that's the County's responsibility, nor is it the County's, um, motivation to, to check on our property. The only reason the County is coming around to assess our property is, is to pull money out of our pocket. So, uh, they're they're not they're not assessing our property to benefit us at all. Preston, you so, were going to say something to this, Spencer. I'm sorry, Spencer. You're going to say something about that. Well, I and if I'm on the right track with the with the question uh, that he's asking, the the, the adjuster would be the person that would uh, assess the amount of damage. Um, it, it, as far as if you had tornado damage, hail damage, things like that. Um, it according to how much replacement cost you had, as long as it's within that amount, which it, it very well will be for the, for a roof or something that's, you know, even up to 50% damage of the home. But, uh, the, adju- the adjuster and the claims processor who will evaluate that amount of damage and, um, and go from there. So that, that's how that would happen. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Preston. I, I know that we, we got around the question. I don't know if we got it exactly, but if someone is listening and that got it a little better than we do, we'd love to have a better answer. Uh, and the number is 877-MPB-RING, but you can uh, send an email to fixit101 at mpbonline.org. John is on the line in Tupelo, and he's got a question about home insurance. What's going on, John? Oh, not much. Uh, just a real quick question. I have a, a backyard in my house that has a bunch of really cool trees in it. I love it. It keeps it nice and shady back there during mm-hmm. the summertime. But what I've been noticing here as the wind, wind starts, seems to get a little bit more violent each and every year, uh, I'm starting to have limbs fall into my backyard off of those trees. I fell through a deck that I've built out there that I have a couple chairs that sit on. My question is, uh, and this is to the in, uh, insurance guy, yeah. um, if, if I wanted to, if it, I have a mother-in-law house out there that, I, that is covered by my homeowner's insurance. Uh, if we identify any trees around that that are going to be a potential hazard to, to it, would, would, is, is, is it something where insurance companies might come in and actually pay to have the tree taken out because i know i pointed one out to to the power people and it was over their lines and they came and they chopped it down for free and took it away but i don't know is that something that uh insurance uh would be interested in or could do anything about john did you get that question or uh, uh sorry spencer did you get that question yeah, fine. I, I i did um and and you're you're speaking on um on will they come out and pay to remove the tree to prevent further damage or future damage is that correct correct yeah. Um, no, no, for the most part, I have heard one time ever, and I'm not sure exactly how that worked, um, that an insurance company paid to remove a tree. Um, but, but no, the, the, the answer typically would be that's, that's on the homeowner to, uh, to, to make sure that's taken care of. Um, now, of course, if it falls and damages the home, that it will be covered. Um, but it's best to, to go ahead to and remove that tree yourself just from a safety issue because it could injure you or somebody else. Hey, Spencer, so y'all will pay for it after the tree falls down. Right, right. <laughs> if it were to damage the property, yes, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> and that's the way it works, folks, right there. <laughs> well, look. Well, uh, hey, hey, guys. Yeah. Uh, I want. I want to make one. I want to make one quick comment. What if the tree was in your neighbor's yard? Uh, your insurance company is not going to pay for that either. But when it falls on your house, your insurance company is going to pay for the neighbor's tree hitting your house. Wow. So that, that is just, correct. Just to complicate things a little more. We need, we need like an org chart or something. All right, folks. Uh, <laughs> Fix It 101 is a production. Wow, that's fast. Fix It 101 is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio and is funded by the generous contributions from listeners like you. Our show is produced by Mr. Java Chapman. Our call screener today was Liz Gill. For Pam Pibus, Jeff Sammons, and our guest insurance agent, Spencer Radcliffe, I'm Jason Klein. Stay tuned for our Wednesday 10 a.m. program, Everyday Tech with Jay White. And join us next Wednesday at 9 for Fix It 101 only on MPB Think Radio.